anyway, um, this is a topic that um, I actually seems a little odd. I enjoy talking about it because I think it, it gives us insight into an issue that the veterinary profession really hasn't been dealing with. And my entire career as a veterinarian has been spent at the ASPCA. So I know that when I first went into the shelter and was presented with animals that had been abused, I had no clue what to do about it. And one of the distressing things to me is that even as I, I go around and I lecture about this, I find that there's not many other veterinarians doing that. And certainly, as we uh, develop our veterinary forensic specialty, there are more and more vets that are talking about this issue. But when I got started, all of the people that were lecturing about it were not veterinarians. So we had people that were sociologists. We had Frank Asione, Randy Lockwood, who were well-versed in the link and well-versed in, in dealing with the issues that veterinarians have to deal with. But sometimes lacking credibility when they talk to veterinary audiences to say, you really don't understand unless you've been a practicing veterinarian. So what I'm going to try to do today, we're going to, we're, and we're going to discuss the link a little bit further. Yeah, so we're going to, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. I, I can do a two-hour lecture on the link. We're just going to touch on a lot of different topics today because I want to give you a broad overview of just how complex this is. And, and one of the other reasons I like doing this lecture is because I'm going to ask some questions that I don't have answers for, and you're going to ask me questions that I can't answer. Because it, it is so complex. It's not black and white. And I've been accused at points in time of making it sound like, well, if you think an animal's been abused, call the police right away. And it's not as simple as that. So we're going to cover a range of topics. And what I want to start out with is sort of giving you some various cases to give you a sense of just all of the different uh, parameters that animal cruelty uh, encompasses. So this first case comes out of DVM News Magazine about 10 years ago. And are you all familiar with VIN, Veterinary Information Network? So they write into VIN tips. And this vet is saying, he's from Texas, that, well, you know, I got a client in a day with a dog that I think has been used in dog fighting. And I don't particularly like this client. But I really feel like um, I should do something. And do you think I ought to file a report? And so I got three responses. And as you can see from the slide, nobody said anything about helping the animal or filing a report. One vet said, why would you want to get involved in this? You think this is bad? I know for a fact that all the, the dog fighters around here crop the dog's ears with a bottle of old granddad and a pocket knife. And I thought, well, that's not exactly the professional response I was looking for. The second vet said, well, why would you want to report it? You're not mandated to report it to the state board, so it's not an issue for you. And the third person kind of said, well, you know, you can get in trouble if you file a report and you don't have any proof. So you ought to just, you know, leave it alone. And if it happens again, then you might want to consider taking some action. And I thought, well, that's not a very enlightened approach. Nobody's talking about the animal. Nobody said, how badly was the dog injured? You know, is this the type of activity that you want in your community as healthcare professionals that are charged not only with protecting, you know, animal health, but also, you know, public health and public welfare? We know that dog fighting is not only illegal, but it's involving drugs and gambling and weapons and, and gang activity, violence, all the things that you don't want in your community. And who's the person that's best poised? to recognize it and deal with it. It's our profession. And yet nobody uh, talked about the other implications of this type of activity. The second case came as a surprise to me. And this was a fairly recent one, about five years ago, where a horse owner was charged with animal cruelty because he refused to euthanize his horse, despite the advice of the veterinarians who said that would be the most humane action to take. And as you'll see in the presentation where I talk about animal cruelty is defined by statute, well, Massachusetts animal cruelty laws don't say anything about um, failure to euthanize a sick animal or an injured animal as cruelty. So he pled no contest. And I was surprised that the vets even and tried to take this case forward. And that's another point that I'm going to make. It's not the vet's decision. Okay, The vet doesn't get to say, this is animal abuse. I want to go to court. You know, there are a lot of other elements that go into making these decisions. But at the case, the vets presented a really strong case. And one of the things that they did was they videotaped the horse trying to walk. And they said that when they showed that tape in court, people in the courtroom started to cry. So you can imagine how the defendant felt at that point in time, that he just better you know, plead no contest.
contest, and he was sentenced to pay the court costs. And one of the interesting things that he was he was sentenced to was during his probation, they said that he could be asked to undergo counseling. And when you talk to, you know, um, psychiatrists and sociologists and psychologists and all the people in, in that field, they say, how exactly do we counsel people about animal uh, cruelty? We really don't have <clears throat> sort of a treatment protocol for that. What they used to do was they used to tell people, well, you abuse an animal, go work at the animal shelter. So that's kind of like telling a pedophile to go work at the you know, foster care center with kids. Um, so, but, but they said that he had to undergo court-ordered counseling and that he couldn't own any more animals during his probation period. So we're looking at the courts are looking for ways to deal with animal cruelty that's going to be effective. And a lot of the things that they've done in the past haven't been. And so often the courts feel like, well, we don't want to send people to jail. And a monetary fine isn't necessarily going to be effective either. So what are some of the, the things that we can do that are going to be effective in not only being punitive, but also being preventative, and also helping people to do better by their animals? This is an interesting case. Um, Dr. Y was indicted on a, a count of felony animal abuse. Okay, so we're talking something pretty seriously here. And he was accused of punching a chihuahua um, five times in the head to the point where he dislodged the animal's eye, which he later uh, sewed shut. When they did the investigation, he was also indicted for theft because they said he charged for a vaccination that he didn't give. But the vet board cleared him of the charges. And how do you think that happened? I mean, think about the vet board looks at cases where there's negligence or incompetence or something that violates the Veterinary Practice Act. And so actually veterinarians got up and testified that, well, this, this could happen. It's not that unusual that in, for example, restraining a brachycephalic animal or the Pekingese or something, that their eyes might pop out. So they're saying that, that they, in fact, banded together to help clear this veterinarian. And I'm saying, well, that's one thing, but um, how does that relate to punching the animal five times in the head? Um, another interesting case of a vet tech that um, was diverting drugs from the veterinary practice. And so when they looked at the charges to file, um, they decided not only to go for the drug theft, but also animal abuse by saying that in, in the course of withdrawing the anesthetic from the vial and replacing it with water, the animals were not receiving appropriate analgesia. And so therefore, it would be animal cruelty. So that's sort of a creative way of, of looking at how the laws can be applied in some of these cases. This Chicago veterinarian, and you may have seen this because this is a fairly recent case. I think it was around 2011. Um, he was arrested for covering up dog fighting. And the, the investigators, and this was an undercover investigation, they went to him with dogs. And they said to him, we're fighting these dogs, and we want you to get them back in fighting condition as soon as possible. So he not only uh, went ahead and did that, he also gave them narcotics and painkillers for dogs he didn't see. And when you look at this veterinarian's history, his license was suspended, and he'd been disciplined six times. So I haven't been able to, to get the follow-up to see what the final disposition of this case was, because these cases can drag on for years. But in Illinois, veterinarians are mandated to report animal abuse, so he was also charged with failure to report dogfighting. So he got a little extra uh, charge there that I don't think um, anybody was thinking about. This particular case is very interesting for animal shelters because there were seven chihuahua puppies with parvo presented to this shelter. And the puppies were in such bad shape that the staff called animal control because they felt this was animal cruelty. The puppies had to be euthanized, and the shelter had to, to institute all types of protocols for quarantining dogs, and some of them became ill. And the question becomes, how? seriously ill were these puppies by the time they brought them into the shelter? And an additional question, we all know that puppies can suffer from parvo pretty rapidly. I've seen them and one day they seem to be fine, and the next day they are dehydrated, they're depressed, they're vomiting, they have bloody diarrhea. And imagine the cost of trying to treat seven chihuahua puppies. So you have to wonder uh, what options do people have if, if they are fearful of going to the animal shelter because they might be charged with animal cruelty, then what are they going to do if they can't afford to treat the animal? So 
that's one of the things that I'm telling you. There's some ethical dilemmas that we're facing. There's some, you know, financial uh, dilemmas that we're facing, and a lot of them are really unique to the veterinary profession. And this last case is interesting because this New York City woman was videotaped beating a dog, and she was using a shovel, hitting him in the head. And the neighbor, who had just apparently been hearing this animal being abused for months, finally taped it and filed a report. And you know, we think that people don't take abused animals to the vet, and we're going to see a couple of slides later on that talk about that. But in this particular case, they took this dog to the vet 11 times in seven months, okay. and an alleged you know, financial expenditure of $7,000. And this animal had traumatic injuries. And I talked to the investigator who uh, was on this case, and I asked her, did the vet ever ask the people about the cause of the injuries? And he said, no. I said, in the course of my you know, career at the ASPCA, I ran a clinic. And it was open to the public and also took care of the shelter animals. And anytime somebody came in with a traumatic injury, I always asked them, how did this happen? Um, not even necessarily thinking that it might be an abuse case, but just as part of the history. And yet, this vet never once, with all of these traumatic injuries, thought to ask, you know, what's, what's happening here? So when we talk about sort of our ethical and moral obligations, and I did allude to the fact that ours are kind of unique, it's because outside of pediatricians, nobody else is really dealing with a patient and a client. And how often do we run into situations where what the client wants us to do to the animal is not necessarily in its best interest? And we can talk about cosmetic surgery. We can talk about a lot of different procedures that might not be considered for the welfare of the animal. And when we start talking about farm animal issues and our obligations to society, we certainly recognize that many of the procedures that are done in the interest of agricultural practice, if that was a companion animal, would be considered animal cruelty. And yet, most of the state laws that deal with animal cruelty exempt farm animal practices. And we have to ask ourselves, as veterinary professionals, why is it that those rights and protections shouldn't be extended to all animals? So because we're charged with protecting the um, food supply, we have these additional obligations to society and to our colleagues, our peers, and to ourselves. And one of the, the um, more difficult issues for me to deal with is when veterinarians come up to me afterwards and say, you know, one of the veterinarians in the practice they think is not providing adequate analgesia or they think may be um, abusing the animals, being very rough, hitting them in the head, so on and so forth. And they're not quite sure what to do about that. They've tried talking to the individual and it was about offering a post-op analgesia and they say it's not necessary. Or whatever the case may be, what should they do next? And I said, if you've talked to the person and talked to the owner of the practice and no action is forthcoming, then you have to make a decision. Do you want to continue to work there? Do you want to file a report? You know, what do you do? So certainly um, some issues that other professionals don't necessarily face. And here's just a couple of, of dilemmas that this one came out of New Zealand where I think this young man was about 18 years old and he took his puppy to the clinic because it had been hit by a car, and they told him that it would cost about almost $2,000 to treat the animal. And he said, well, he could only pay them three fifty dollars a week, which they refused, and told him that he had to leave the puppy there to be euthanized. Well, he came back later on and stole the puppy because he decided he didn't want his animal to be killed because they wouldn't accept his financial plan. And I can tell you that you're going to run into these types of situations in private practice, especially you know in this economy where people really cannot afford some of the veterinary bills that they're and it's not unusual to run up a thousand dollar bill um, just on one visit. And so um, he was threatened with animal cruelty because they said you either have to treat this animal or euthanize it or you're in violation of the animal cruelty laws. And so what happened in one of these feel good stories, uh, the press found out about it and what happened? People all donated money to, re to fix this little puppy. But you know that's just one scenario. What happens to all the other folks that it doesn't get to the press? And this other story is also particularly disturbing to me. It was an older woman who was charged and found guilty of animal cruelty. because She abandoned her dog. She couldn't afford to feed it any longer. She felt really bad about it and took it to the shelter. And the shelter said, well, this is an older dog. We can't get adopted. It's going to be put to sleep. So just imagine that you're faced with that situation. And we all think, well, this would never happen to us. We would never let anybody put us in a position of telling us that you know, we have to euthanize our dog, or we have to relinquish it to a shelter. But 
you know, things happen. And so she decided, rather than euthanize it, to turn it loose on the street in the hopes that it could survive on the streets or maybe somebody else would take the dog in. But almost every state um, has a law where abandoning an animal is, is cruelty. So what we don't know is, in the course of the investigation, what did they find out that made them decide to um, charge this person with, with cruelty? And that's another kind of take-home lesson for us is that we feel, well, I don't want to file a report because I don't want this person to go to jail. And I can tell you that in most cases, people are not going to jail because we file a report. And in most cases, there may not even be an investigation. But what it does is it makes people understand that they have responsibilities and obligations. And for all we know, maybe this, this was the 10th dog that this woman had released. Or maybe there were other underlying circumstances that made them think that um, this should be animal cruelty. So we shouldn't feel bad if the charges and, and the consequences are uh, not what we'd like to see happen, because we also recognize that if we don't do anything, then nothing's going to happen, and that that animal is going to continue to be at risk. So the AVMA decided to tackle this. And this was a JAVMA brief that appeared. It's got to be at least 15 to 20 years ago. And they were talking about animal abuse and discussing why is it this an issue that our profession needs to deal with. So the first uh, point was that you could be asked to testify as an expert in a case. So for example, animal uh, control brings you an animal that they said was set on fire. They have caught the person. They need you to document the evidence. So it's pretty straightforward. You don't have to say how it happened or, or, or why it happened. You just have to corroborate, collect the evidence, and present it in court. It could be that you're in a state where you're mandated to report cruelty. So you need to know what it is and how to deal with it. What are your options? It could be, and we saw in some of those other cases, where you might end up as a defendant, and you think, well, that would never happen to me. But you know what happens with some of these cases where a lot of the cruelty is involved with restraint. And the public doesn't understand restraint the way we do. And I remember the first time I saw somebody scruff a cat. And I thought, well, you scruff my cat, man. We're fighting. You know, you, this, this looks really brutal. When I first saw them put a twitch on a horse, I'd say, so you create pain to divert from other pain? So for, for owners, um, some of the things that we do that we take is just, as a matter of course, um, the public might not like. And so certainly physical restraint, things like that, might be an issue. And that's where a lot of the cases come in. It's the cases where cruelty is invoked is failure to provide appropriate analgesia and for restraint issues. And then there's the public health implications of the link which again, we'll talk about a little bit, but which is essentially saying that when animals are abused, people are at risk and vice versa. But the one thing they didn't have on the list was that it was the right thing to do. You know, when you think about the veterinarian's oath and you know, protecting you know, animal health and animal welfare and relieving animal suffering, so on and so forth, wouldn't it make sense that one of our ethical obligations would be to uh, try to protect animals that we think have been deliberately um, abused or cruelly treated? And so the profession has actually taken a stand on it. And most of the professional associations, with the major ones that have addressed the issue, are all supporting reporting animal abuse. So that's AVMA, um, American Animal Hospital Association. The executive board of the AVMA doesn't go so far as to say we should report. But they do support getting involved in these cases by suggesting there should be immunity in its Model Practice Act. And it's not just a, an issue here in the States, though. Can we see the Canadians support it in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, Norway. Lots of countries are very concerned about this. And I can tell when um, I went to speak at the, a conference in South Africa on this issue, and I thought, wow, I have no idea what the issues are here. I mean, this is people were coming from Zambia, and Uganda, and Nigeria, from all over the continent and around the world, and it was standing room only. And I don't get that when I speak in the States. I mean, everybody was concerned about it. It was very exhilarating to me to do these talks on uh, animal sheltering, the ASV guidelines for uh, care of animals in shelters. And everybody's concerned about these issues. So it's not just an issue here in our country. So let's look at the AVMA position. I mean, the AVMA doesn't say anything without you know, using a microscope to examine every word. And you can see that in the statement where they start out by at least admitting that veterinarians may observe cases of animal abuse or animal neglect. A lot of veterinarians think that they don't see it. And I've actually been told that 
they didn't need for me to come and speak because they were dealing with a high-end clientele and that they knew that they didn't have any animal abuse in their practices. So very important for the AVMA to say, you may see these cases. The next point there is that it's defined by federal or state laws or local ordinances. So, so often veterinarians say, well, how is cruelty defined? I don't know if it's cruelty or not. Just because I think it's cruelty, it may not be. And they're right. There's a statutory definition which varies in every state. So recognize that you're not defining it. The courts are defining it. The next thing that they say is that you can try to resolve this through education. Because that's the next argument. Well, I don't think my client needs to go to jail or that they need to have a, a, some type of a, a record with law enforcement. Uh, why can't I just talk to them? And the ABMA is saying you can. Some of these situations are just going to be neglect. And it's just a matter of client education. But when that's not appropriate, then they say it's your responsibility to report to the appropriate authorities. So they're not saying animal control or the Humane Society. It's your responsibility to find who are the appropriate authorities, and then you file the report. A very important piece that they ad added, because this, this statement has been revised several times, and they added this point about whether or not reporting is mandated by law. So think again back to that first case with Vin Tips, where the one vet wrote in and said, well, you're not mandated to report it, so why would you bother? And the statement goes on. Disclosure may be necessary to protect the health and welfare of animals and people. And that's an allusion to the link. And if you look at the um, mandatory reporting, uh, I'm sorry, the position statement of the UK, where they talk about uh, reporting, they make a very strong allusion to the importance of being aware of the link. And that veterinarians should be aware that accurate record keeping and documentation is invaluable. So it's like trying to prosecute a case of murder, and there's no body of the victim. So really, for some of these cases to go forward, um, we need to be sure that we are keeping the records appropriately for the courts. And the final piece just got added. The ABMA considers it the responsibility of the vet to educate clients regarding humane care and treatment of animals. So if I think back to my veterinarian education at Cornell, and all of the things that we were taught, everything focused on the physical examination. So when a client came in, is he eating? Is he drinking? Is he pooping? You know, excessive, you know, diarrhea, um, what, whatever. All of the things that focused on physical sta status of the animal. Nobody asked anything about the behavior of the animal. And, and I think that in part is because we're not all being taught behavior. Do you have a behavior course here at UW? Is that part of the core curriculum? Because at a lot of the colleges, it's an elective. They have you know, lectures come in that are sponsored by you know, a pharmaceutical company or something like that. But you really are not going to ask questions where you can't answer them. If, the, if you say to the person, well, you know, how's the animal doing? The UK has a brochure that says, is your pet happy? Now think about that. Do you, do you guys think that your pets are happy? I, I spend a lot of time trying to make sure my cat's happy. So I hope he's happy. But the, their brochure is based on the five freedoms. So they ask you, you add, it, most of us would have no problem saying that the animal is free from hunger or thirst, and it's free from pain, injury, or disease. But what about distress? Is the animal tied up in the backyard all day? Is the animal se suffering from separation anxiety? All of these types of things that we really don't think about. So the AVMA is now saying that it's our responsibility to talk about humane care and, and treatment of animals. And so the last revision that I know of was in 2009. But you know, looking a little bit further and digging a little bit deeper, and you think, well, OK, so the AVMA is saying it, AHA is saying it, I guess we ought to do it. But veterinarians are still reluctant about it. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But we've also done a couple of studies. And one of the studies indicated that whether or not reports would be made depended on the reaction of the client. Well, that kind of makes sense. I mean, this is kind of a tough conversation to have with somebody if you think they brought the animal in and you ask them how, you know, what happened and they tell you the animal got hit by a car and you look at the, the nature of the injuries and you don't think that's necessarily true. How do you entertain that conversation? And it may be that you don't have that conversation. It may be that you just file a report. It may be that this is a good client and you feel comfortable having the conversation. But nobody wants their clients to be angry at them. And also recognize that in having that conversation, it may not be that the person is abusing the animal. You know, we, a lot of times we get a case where, oh, you know what? It seems like every time the dog is limping, it's when I've gone out of town and you know, my neighbor's taking care of the dog. Or you, know, you have uh, the dog 
belongs to a couple and it's really bonded to the wife but not the husband and then the animal gets abused every time that the wife is away and the wife might not be aware of it and then she starts putting two and two together so recognize it doesn't have to be the person it could be a neighbor and they'd actually thank you for raising that question it's just like could this have happened in a way that you're not aware of is this an animal that's left in the backyard all day and maybe the neighbor is upset because he barks all day. Is this an animal that escapes out of the yard? So on and so forth. So lots of different things that we could be looking at. And if all we're worried about the reaction of the client, um, we need to develop methods where we have a way to deal with the client that is non-threatening to the client. Uh, the Massachusetts vets all said, well, we think that um, we have an ethical obligation, but please don't mandate us to do it. I think that's the wrong approach. I think mandating reporting actually frees you up so that you don't have the argument. And that really was brought home to me when I was watching a, some doctor program and the doctor's saying to the wife, you know, I think you keep bringing your son here with this broken arm and I think that there's something else going on. I don't think he keeps falling off of the swing. And then she confesses that, you know, her husband has a temper and that he's, you know, hurt the child and that she's going to protect him in the future. And, you know, the doctor says, well, I'm mandated to report this. I could lose my license if I don't. And it sounds like this is a family in trouble. The next time, this little boy might get killed. And how would you feel in that circumstance where you don't report the animal abuse and something really awful happens to that animal? So, again, we're not handling these cases by ourselves. And being mandated to report, nobody reports because they're mandated. Most people report because they feel it's the right thing to do. And being mandated protects them for doing it. And this unpublished study out of Canada was one that really resonated with me. And this was a case that if the owner showed remorse, they wouldn't file a report. So here's another scenario. The person comes in. It's a good client. The dog's got broken ribs. And the client says to you, look, I've been coming here for years. You know me. I'm a good person. It's been a horrible week. I lost my job. You know, I've got all these financial problems. And the dog just kept getting in the way. I got angry and I kicked him. Okay. I promise it will never happen again. You know, let's just take care of him. I want the best for Poochie. Can you pay all the bills. Here's the money up front. I promise you it will never happen again. What are most of us going to do? Are you going to give that guy a pass? Or are you going to file a report? Makes sense to me that you're going to try and work with that person. But the question is, what if there are other animals at home that are, are being abused? And are you going to be responsible for ensuring the safety of that animal? You know, and I, I had a case years and years ago when I was running the clinic. And interestingly enough, I'm working for the ASPCA, and the ASPCA says to me, um, don't file reports when you suspect an animal's been abused. And I'm, I work with the agents here. I can just call them up and say, hey, come on over and take a look at this for me. But the feeling was that if we got a reputation for turning people in, people would say, well, don't go to the ASPCA because they'll take your animal and you'll go to jail. So we really felt like we weren't supposed to do anything. And I had a person that brought in a, a puppy with a fracture. And I, at that time, we used to give all kinds of, of free care. And I said to them, well, you know, um, how much money do you have? And they said, well, $50. And back then, I guess it probably would have cost about 600 And I said, well, we'll do it for you. And they said, we're going to take the puppy home and think about it. And I'm like, what is there to think about? Nobody's going to do this for you for less than that. And they came back, and we put like a, a just a Robert Jones bandage on it and told them, you know, come back tomorrow, and didn't hear from them for two weeks. And when they came back, the same bandage was on the leg, and the leg was gangrenous, and we had to amputate it. So we went ahead and did the amputation, and then they told us they didn't want a three-legged dog. You know, so it's just like, oh, boy, it's a good thing I don't have a gun right now. Cause, um, you know, but, but thinking back on that, that's the kind of case where you have to do compliance. You have to call them up the next day or file a report and say, you know what? I want an agent to go to that house if they don't report back to me and make sure that they get care for that animal. So recognizing again that um, there are a lot of different factors that go into to looking at these cases. And if they show remorse or they show concern and whatnot, but do I want to bear the responsibility for following up on those cases? And if I decide that's what I want, I'm not going to file a report, then in fact I must do it. So where do the states stand on this and recognize that we're all over the place? There's only a handful of states that mandate vets to report abuse, and it's not the states that you would think. You'd think that we'd have it in New York. Well, we don't. We don't have it in Massachusetts, where the MSPCA is. 
But we have it in Alabama. You know, and I don't want to disparage Alabama, but I have to admit, when I saw them on the list, I was surprised. And when I actually went down to Alabama to speak about it, I was challenged by the vets there who said I was wrong. And it was a little bit difficult. I called the state board so that I could get chapter and verse. But the vets down there didn't know about it. The vets in West Virginia are mandated to report. Cal Colorado, California, Illinois. Um, it's a handful of, of states that, that require it, maybe, maybe a dozen. Some of them say it's got to be in writing. Some of them say that it's just for animal fighting. In Wisconsin, it's for animal fighting. Some say you may report. That's, what, that's the way that New York says it, you may report. And New York provided immunity for doing that. Very interesting that Kansas allows the vets to seize animals. And I used to always, when I was lecturing, I'd say, you know, you have to recognize that if you think an animal is at risk, you can't seize that animal. Animals are property. So you can't just take somebody's property. That's why you need to file a report. If you think that, you know, this animal could be killed or, or you know, the situation is going to get worse and you want to keep the animal, you can't do that. But in Kansas, they can. But the, the thing that they didn't do was they didn't give the Kansas vets immunity. So they don't do it. You know, and I understand that. And I'm thinking, well, shouldn't you guys get together and maybe try to get the law changed or add immunity in so that if you do feel that you want that right? And a couple of other states have tried to legislate that vets could seize animals, and they haven't been successful. And I can't remember which states it was, but I thought, you know, at least we're moving a little bit forward. I mean, in really serious cases. And I had one vet tell me that he felt an animal was at risk, and he just took it. And he said, I didn't care. He says, I'm six foot four, and I was ready to fight. And so, um, you know, that's what I'm saying. Vets, when they do it, it's because they feel it's the right thing to do. It's not necessarily that they're mandated, but they are protected if they're mandated, if, in fact, they want to take action. Is there a question here? So I guess the question is, um, if you feel an animal's at risk and you tell the owner that you want to keep it to hospitalize it, where your ulterior motive is really to get it away from the person, I would say um, what you need to do if you do that is you need to follow up and file a report and have law enforcement come and, and, and you know, take care of it. Because once they, if they sign the consent form, um, then you're covered said that I'm hospitalizing the animal. That's one of the things that we do when we're trying to document the evidence is, for example, I'll tell you a little bit later about taking whole body radiographs. And you can't do any diagnostic testing without getting consent or permission. But once you get consent and permission to take a radi radiograph, then you can go ahead and take the whole body radiograph. You can take pictures of the animal, so on and so forth. But um, yes, you have to do everything legally, get consent, get you know permission, get things signed. And one of, one of the cases that I had, and the first case that I was involved with with reporting, I didn't file a report. I was working uh, for the ASPCA and had an outpatient clinic. And we were in an area that, it was like a compound. We had a gate around the building. We had barbed wire. We had a guard. And literally, we knew that there was dog fighting and all kinds of criminal activity going on. And the young man brought a puppy into me that had suspicious looking injuries that looked like dog fighting. And as I was examining the animal, one of my technicians called our Humane Law Enforcement Department. And they called me while I was in the midst of the exam and said, keep him there. We're on the way. And so I said to him, you know, have a seat. I'm going to take the animal in the back, clean out its ears, you know, run some blood tests, so on and so forth. And so, you know, in a sense, I was a little bit of subterfuge there saying, I'm just stalling until they could get there. And it, it actually turned out to, to have a really positive outcome. Because as it turned out, he had rescued the dog from dog fighters. Okay? He had been in the park, and these guys were getting ready to kill this dog, or just abandon it. And he talked them into letting him take it. And he'd been trying to fatten it up unsuccessfully. So he came to us. And I had asked the agents, to, you know, don't come in like stormtroopers. Just you know, say, we're just here. We're kind of interested in where you got this dog, and so on. And in fact, saying to them, do you know the guys who turned this dog loose? Because maybe we can you know, find out you know, about the dog fighting that um, this animal was involved in. So yeah, sometimes we have to be a little bit creative in what we do to, to get the results that we want. But the, the important thing that we, we need to do is, is be in full compliance with the Veterinary Practice Act and the law. 
So here's your animal fighting requirement, and it says if you have reason to believe that an animal has been in a fight. See, some of the language says that you have to know, uh, have reasonable belief, that you have to have uh, direct knowledge, so on and so forth. This language that you have reason to believe, and that's going to be based on the physical evidence that you see, that you report it to the local humane officer or to local law enforcement. So that's one of the myths, is that you only report this to the SPCA or the Humane Society. We have to remember this, and I haven't said it, but uh, this animal cruelty is a crime. Okay, so when we're sitting and we're debating whether or not to report it, just think about the fact that this could be criminal activity. We're not lawyers, we don't necessarily know for a fact, but there needs to be an investigation. So you're not saying it's animal cruelty. You have reason to believe that an animal has been in a fight, in violation of the law, and that they're saying file a report in writing, have a description and location of the animal, describe the injuries, and so on and so forth. And then it's up to law enforcement to do the investigation. So. I want to emphasize again that this is a multidisciplinary effort. We, we are not powerful enough to say, you've been cruel to that dog, I think you should go to jail. You know, our system doesn't work like that. We're responsible for the medical investigation. Law enforcement comes and does the investigation. They're going to determine whether or not that dog got hit by a car. It may be that they'll go to the house and the people will say, yeah, we saw the dog get hit by a car. Or it could be that they go to the, uh, the neighbor and the neighbor says, that dog, they beat that dog all the time. That, you don't have access to that information. All you've got is what the owner's telling you. So that investigation may go there. It's like with the dog fighting, where these people in the Vin Tips um, case that I presented were saying, the receptionist told the vet, I know these people fight the dogs. I know it. You want to have an investigator go there, and maybe they'll see a lot of dogs tethered in the backyard. They'll see all of the equipment that is associated with dog fighting, so on. Again, information that you don't have. So you want there to be an investigation, and that's what your report does. It starts that process going. Then the prosecutor is going to look at all the evidence that you've amassed, both from your physical examination and what the investigation is, has brought up, and then they're going to decide whether or not there's a case. You know, so we might think, well, how the heck did they decide you know, to charge those people that dropped off the seven you know, parvo puppies at the shelter with cruelty? Well, the prosecutor is not going to um, try to go to court unless they think they've got a good case. They like to win. It's one of the reasons that we push so hard for, for animal cruelty to be a felony, because the prosecutors in law enforcement are much more likely to do an investigation for felony animal cruelty than they are for misdemeanor cruelty. So it's animal control, it's shelters, it's social services, lots of other elements that get involved in this. We're being asked to report our suspicions. We need to know what the warning signs are. We need to educate clients about responsible pet care. We serve as medical experts who gather evidence, document evidence. We're increasingly being asked to go to the crime scene, and that's particularly in a case where you're dealing with hoarders, for example. And you're going to be asked to testify in court. So you can't document all the evidence and then ask your associate to go to court for you because you've got stage fright and don't want to be asked to testify. Okay, it's got to be the person that, that handles the case. And then, unfortunately, we've seen where you might also end up as a defendant in the case. There's a question, yes. Right. Okay, so the question is, if you don't believe what the person is telling you in the history, should you file that in the report anyway, in your medical record? And the answer would be yes. You should say, the client says so and so and so. And what one of the things that we say, when you're doing your differentials, one of the things that you can put down is non-accidental injury, which means that you're listing that as a possibility. So, um, yeah, you should say what they're saying. If it goes to court, you know, the, the, yeah, it's the case. 
the, the question is, if it goes to court, you know, are they going to look at, at the record? What, how, what impact does that have on it? And certainly, you're going to say, yes, the client reported that this was how the injury occurred. Part of what you're going to do is say, based on the evidence that I have examined, that this is not plausible. Okay, this is a great vein that they're saying fell off the bed and sustained the comminuted fracture of the femur. That's not plausible. You know, so again, you, you do want to show, you want to document what they've said, and you also want to get witnesses. All right, so if you can have other people that are hearing what's being said, so on and so forth. And a lot of times, if there's more than one person, like the family comes in, you're going to get all, well, it happened two weeks ago. No, it was a week ago. No, it, you know, so you, you do want to document that there was confusion in reporting of the history. So all of that is, should be included. Um, so just a word about the link. And I'll, we don't have a lot of time to talk about this. But the, the important thing to get about the link is what I alluded to earlier. When animals are abused, humans are at risk, and vice versa. So animal abuse is often the first point of intervention in a case when we're talking about human violence. And so think about, again, a lot of times if you've got dog fighting going on, and in the course of the investigation of the dog fighting, they may find that children in the house are being abused, that there's domestic violence, that there's elder abuse. There's a lot of other things going on. So sometimes that's just the tip of the iceberg that gets things started. And here's, I'm going to just go over a couple of studies. This one, I, I like it, it's from New South Wales about 10 years ago. And they looked at several individuals that um, were convicted of animal cruelty. And they found that 62% of those people had other offenses. It wasn't just animal cruelty. It was drugs, firearms, sexual assault, so on. Only 1% were uh, convicted just for animal cruelty. And 17% had also performed sexual abuse. And the this was a study that was done by the police. And their conclusion was that animal abuse is a better predictor of sexual assault than previous convictions for these other types of offenses. And certainly when you're talking, when you're calling the police and talking about, you know, you've got a, a case where you think an animal's been cruelly treated, and they say, well, it's just an animal, and we're investigating rapes and homicides and all kinds of other things, it's nice to be able to say to them, one, I think the law has been broken, and it's your responsibility to investigate. And two, we know for a fact that um, sometimes when you're investigating animal abuse, that you're going to find that there's other things going on in the household, including violence. And one of the things that we do at the ASPCA is we try to do training for law enforcement and prosecutors, because a lot of times they'll go to the crime scene, and it, it may even be a case of, of violence against humans, and they'll be dead animals in the house. And what have they done with those bodies? They've thrown them out. Instead of saying, hey, this is forensics evidence that may show a bigger picture. Um, Merz Perez found that violent offenders in a maximum security prison were much more likely to have uh, committed acts of, of um, animal cruelty. MSPCA found that you know, people, men prosecuted for cruelty were five times more likely to have had acts of violence against humans. Um, 71% of battered women who went to a shelter reported that their partners threatened, hurt, or killed their pets. And some women delay going to the shelter for fear that the partner is going to hurt the pet. We now have orders of protection uh, for women and their pets because we recognize that a lot of times the abuser will say, if you don't come back, I'm going to kill the dog. And so they won't, you know, they won't leave because they recognize that you know, the animal's at risk. And that most of these women had had some type of an interaction with the veterinary professionals. So again, when we think that you know we're not going to be seeing those cases, it's not true. Um, so when do we file a report? Um, I think we file a report when we have a reasonable suspicion that abuse exists. And that suspicion is based on what we see on the physical exam or the historical findings. And a good faith report is considered one where there's an honest purpose, where you know you're not trying to get back at this client because they never pay their bills, or you have a neighborhood dispute or something. It's in keeping with our oath or our duties and obligations. And in or when we're talking about filing a report, we need to know what the law is. So we need to know what the Veterinary Practice Act says. Are the records confidential? Do we have immunity? Are we mandated or voluntary reporters? We need to know the definition of cruelty, the definition of animal. And get this, the definition of animal varies from state to state. Um, and you need to know what the exemptions are. You need to know who to report to. And I think it's so much easier if you're in a practice, if you go down to the local police precinct and say, hey, I'm Dr. Miller. I have a practice down here. I know that I'm mandated to report animal fighting. But you know, if I think an animal's been abused, is there somebody in the department that I can talk to? 
because it's much easier to call up, you know, Joe, the local, you know, patrolman, and say, can you come over? I have a case I need to talk to you about. I'd like for you to go and, and take a look into this. And you don't have to go in with guns blazing, but I'd like you to do a follow-up. And, and you can file reports anonymously, but anonymity can't be guaranteed. If it's a case that's going to go to court, your name's going to come out. If you're fearful about that, one of the things we tell veterinarians to do is ask for a subpoena, because you can't refuse a subpoena. They say, we need to have the medical records. But a lot of our reports come from neighbors. They're not, you know, we get some from veterinarians, but, you know, citizens. And we know people get outraged when animals are abused. And we've seen cases where they generated tons of mail, more so than when we see cases where, you know, a child has been abused, where people are outraged. So, you know, get a name beforehand. Make sure that the hospital you're working at has a policy and procedures for you to report abuse. And then again, look at other organizations. If you're dealing with an animal hoarder, then you may have to talk to social workers. You may need to talk to the health department. So we get pulled into some of these cases, even not because we have initiated the action. But again, there's a hoarder. The local shelter is going to say, we need veterinarian support. And so you may need to um, go and help out with those cases. So I'm going to give you kind of a definition of cruelty that I like for for veterinarians to use, because even though I'm telling you that um, cruelty is defined by state law not, and not the veterinarian, I think we also have to recognize that a lot of the cruelty that we're going to see doesn't rise to the statutory definition. And the definition here in, in Wisconsin is a little bit narrow. So I like for us as a profession to think about it as acts that by intention or neglect cause unnecessary pain or suffering to an animal. And when we look across the spectrum of state laws, you see that that's how it is defined. Uh, neglect can be considered to be animal cruelty. So a lot of times we think of neglect as being benign, the people didn't mean it. Um, think about hoarders. That's usually neglect. But in most cases, the neglect is so severe that we say there's unnecessary pain or suffering, and it becomes cruelty. So it's a continuum of acts that are going to go from sort of what we're seeing here, which is what you're going to see in your practice the animal that's been neglected. You're going to see this in your practice. Not so likely that you're going to see this where somebody's driven a couple of nails in this, this animal's head. And in New York State, this is not felony cruelty because the felony cruelty law only applies to companion animals. So the laws are very vague. They're very broad. It's unfortunate. There's like a patchwork quilt of laws. And as much as I'd like to see us sort of standardize it, because let's face it, cruelty in Texas, that animal's suffering is going to be the same whether it's in Texas or New York. But statutorily, it's not going to be defined that way. So here's cruelty in Wisconsin. No person may treat any animal, whether belonging to the person or another, in a cruel manner. So you've got a definition that's saying cruelty and then saying it's cruel, not really defining it. Okay? And it doesn't prohibit experiments carried on for scientific research or normal or accepted veterinary practices. Why on earth would veterinarians need to be exempt from cruelty laws? You know, and so. Um, also agricultural practice. Cruel means causing unnecessary and excessive pain or suffering or unjustifiable injury or death. So the, the questions we're going to be asked is, is this animal in pain? You know, is it unnecessary? Is it excessive? What's excessive pain? How do we define that? I think these laws are deliberately vague. And a lot of these laws are, are very, very old. So they really need to be updated. Some states go so far as to talk about they have to cruelty is failure to provide shelter that would be normal to maintain uh, you know, a healthy state in an animal, so on and so forth. So we've got some that uh, tethering is cruelty, torture is cruelty, and they go so far as to define torture as neglect. That's in Ohio. So the laws are all over the place. And an animal here is every warm-blooded creature except a human being, also reptiles and amphibians. You know, so uh, some places it's every dumb creature. What does that mean? Um, but anyway, like I said, the laws are all over. So what you know, vets say they don't really see abuse in their practices. We've got a couple of studies that tell us otherwise. This 1999 study, 87% of the vets that responded to the survey said that they thought they'd seen abused animals. You know, and this is without training. So if people were trained to look for it, do you think that percentage might go up a whole lot higher? Pretty similar in Michigan. 88% thought they'd seen it, but only 27% reported it. And this landmark study back in 1983, they looked at pet owning households with a history of child abuse, and they found that utilization of vet services was the same with the norms in the non-abusive population. So yes, 
people with abused animals are seeking out veterinary care. And in these cases, um, in these households, dog bites are 11 times more likely to occur. So I, again, I'm saying if you've got a history of a dog that's been biting, I'm not saying that all biting, there's a connection to abuse, but certainly there might be some, some pointed questions to ask. And the example I like to give of this one was a Cocker Spaniel that was brought to me for euthanasia because it had bitten a child. The dog is on the table, we're giving the injection, and then we notice a rubber band that's embedded in the dog's ear. And the dog's ear is all infected and painful. And you know, it's like immediately stop the euthanasia. This is a case of abuse, probably by the child, talk to the family, and we um, got them to relinquish the dog, and, and we treated it and rehomed it. So this is Pepperoni, came into our, the Berg Memorial Animal Hospital. Okay, this is the animal cruelty center of the world where we fight animal cruelty. And this person says to us, he defecated in the house, so I hit him. He did it again, I hit him again. And he hit him in the head with a hammer. And this was a doctor. Okay, so the doctor was sentenced to anger management. Um, <laughs> are, you, are you worried about that person a little bit? That uh, This is Prince that was thrown down the stairs, and he's got you know rib and pelvic fractures, his leg was bound, so on and so forth. And we're looking at this ligature wound, and trying to figure, well, how did that get there? And they told us. They didn't think there was anything wrong. They, they had the dog tied up by the leg. And you know that takes time to, to occur. That didn't happen overnight. So if they tell you, well, we tied him up a couple of times, we need to be able to go and say, no, I can't tell you how long it took. We can maybe look at granulation tissue and measure it, so on and so forth. But we can say this is more than tying the dog up twice. And this was a felony indictment. Okay, and here's another case. Um, this is a dog, again, mouth was tied shut because he's barking a lot. And uh, the legal determination, they served a warrant for this person, but uh, we weren't able to get them. But we were able to rehome the puppy. So this is what you're going to see. And think back to the Wisconsin definition. Is this condition causing unnecessary or excessive pain and suffering? And the courts are going to look at this differently. We had one court that said, well, this is not cruelty because the person didn't cause it. OK, this is an act of God, the act of nature. Some some states will define cruelty as allowing this to continue when there's a rem reasonable remedy of relief. Okay, so um, that's the, but that's not my, I still have six minutes. Okay, what, let's talk a minute about animal hoarding very quickly. A statutory definition, which I like, is that you have more than a typical number of animals. You uh, just don't seem to be aware about the minimal standards of nutrition, sanitation, shelter, veterinary care. You see illness and death, and that um, the people seem to be unaware that there's a problem. And there's a lot of work and research being done with animal hoarding. It is believed to be part of a psychiatric disorder. And it really, our, our instinct is to go in and try and help by giving you know, free care and, and offering to adopt out some of the animals. But you really need to have a lot of, of intervention with the people that are really seriously um, involved in hoarding and who have the real psychiatric disorder. So just going in, taking the animals out, um, and just giving them free care, the recidivism rate on that's about 100% if you don't do the counseling and the follow-up and support them. A lot of times, they'll just move and start all over. And a lot of times, the only way you can get relief for the victims is by legal intervention. You know, if they're not willing to give up the animals, their property, you can't do it unless you sometimes go and call law enforcement. So the, the goal is not to punish these, these folks. But it's to get help for them and the animals. So this is a real, I mean, imagine going in and just removing these animals and leaving the person behind. I mean, this is obviously a very, very bad case. This is one where the Department of Health is being called because of the stench coming from the house. And are we going to say this is not animal cruelty? You see there's cannibalism going on here. These animals are starving. So this is cruelty. And you know, we're not looking at the intent. We're looking at what's going on. And these animals are suffering regardless of the intent. So good faith report. Make it when you determine that education has failed, it's not appropriate. Look at the number of problems, the severity of the problems, the duration of the problems. Look at the attitude of the people, um, injuries that could not have occurred the way they told you. They've got discrepancies in the history. Ask them about animals they've had in the past, and they either don't know or don't care. They, you're trying to get information, and they're just indifferent and saying, hey, let's, not, let's just treat it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't care. 
I just want you know to, to move on from here. You keep telling them that this is a painful condition, and they're like, "Nah, I don't really don't think so." He just he's scared when he comes here, and that's why he's acting that way. When you get animals like this that are really badly matted, and you think that's just the case, to tell them, "Well, you just have to go and get you know him groomed and do it as soon as you can." This is an animal you need to hospitalize now. We've removed the mats on some of these animals, especially around their legs, and found that they're nearly gangrenous because of the constriction to the blood supply. So these really are emergency situations. When they come in loaded down with ticks and, and, and maggots and all kinds of other you know, heavy flea infestations, all of these things are telling us this is an animal that's at risk. And you don't want to just put him back in that environment. Especially, what if this is the third time that we've come in and had to do a blood transfusion because that animal was so tick infested? that um, they weren't treating it properly. At that point, you need to really start thinking about, I need to take a different course of action. So we've got to document these cases. Successful prosecution depends on it. Evidence is everything involved with the case, including the animal and its environment. It means the medical records, preliminary and final reports. If you take notes, if you take pictures, if you uh, record what you're seeing, all of that is evidence that has to be documented. Okay, and one of the things that we recognize in this particular situation is the battered animal syndrome, which paralyzed, parallels the battered child syndrome. And we look for fractures in various stages of healing. Okay, and just looking at this radiograph, this person was convicted for animal cruelty previously and was told you can't have any more animals. They went out and got another animal. The neighbors reported them. And when our humane law enforcement went and seized the animal, um, they took radiographs and they found all these different fractures in various stages of healing. So this person went to jail for another 60 days. So in conclusion, I just want to look at the uh, American Animal Hospital Association position, which encourages veterinarians and practice team members, and that's everybody, the technicians, receptionists, everybody in the office should be responsible leaders in the community, that we should work on detecting and reporting animal abuse, and we have to educate ourselves about the warning signs. We have to, to do more in terms of forensics so that we can say time of death more accurately, cause of death, cause of injuries, and that we need to collaborate with animal and health, human welfare groups and professionals to try to reduce violence in our communities. And so often we work in silos. You know, we're only focused on the animal and its physical health, and we need to broaden how we think about that and recognize that a healthy animal has to have behavioral and physical health, and that we want to be seen as, as leaders in our community. If there's something going on there that's violent against animals and people, then we're in a position to do something about it. And AHA, certainly in this statement, uh, is saying that it is our responsibility to do that. So we've got lots of resources out there, and that's available in the notes, so we won't go through them all. But when I started doing this talk, we had no resources. And now we've got five or six books. We've got courses at North American Vet Conference. We've got a track there. There's uh, the International Handbook of Animal Cruelty and Abuse documents all of the studies on the link. Here's some resources on the internet. Lots more um, aids and guides than we used to have. So um, the University of Florida, particularly, in association with the ASPCA, has a forensics program that's, I think, unparalleled anywhere in the country. So you can always talk to me if you have questions. When the evening lectures, some of this will be duplicated, but Jill Buckley, who's a lawyer, is going to elaborate on a lot of these things. We're going to talk more about some of the warning signs and documentation, documentation of dog fighting. So um, I'm, I'm sorry, there has to be some duplication, because I know some people might not be at this morning class, but we're going to go into things in a little bit more detail. So thank you. I'm sorry that you know, I didn't give you more time for questions, but what can I say? <laughs> thank you. I, I've got plenty of time. If anybody doesn't have to run off, I'd be happy to entertain questions. Yes? Yeah, I, sort of the question is, what do you do when people are bringing an animal in for euthanasia and you don't, you're concerned that people won't come to you? And I think that was a concern that pediatricians had and that, you know, 
human health care professionals had say if we file reports, people won't bring their children anymore. That, that hasn't happened. That was the fear that the ASPCA had when I said earlier that they told us not to file reports because that people wouldn't come to us. That didn't happen. You know, so I think that is, that is that a possibility that you might get a reputation for turning people in? I think it's a possibility, but I don't think it's a real concern. You know, it's like veterinarians are concerned about being um, caught up in this whole web of, of um, being sued for filing reports and things like that. And it's really a, a concern that's overblown. So I would say if you, if you get a case where an animal's been brought in for euthanasia and it's in really, really bad shape, you need to file a report because there may be other animals in that household that are at risk that need help. And you know, if other people decide not to come, you, you, you can't control that. If the, the question is if there's no veterinarian on staff, what can non- Well, anybody can file a report. Okay, that's the first thing, and you should document you document the evidence. I'm not I'm not sure I repeated the question, but it's sort of if the animal is turned in and you don't have a vet there, what can you do? And I'm, I'm saying again, take pictures, make sure that the body is held. You have to maintain the chain of custody of the evidence, so you want to make sure that that body is kept under lock and key, and you want to get in touch with the veterinarian as soon as possible, and you also want to call law enforcement as soon as possible so that they can start an investigation. Dr. Newberry, um, I want to make a comment too. Yeah, I think that's something that's important to understand. Um, last year, the Department of Health and Human Services reported that the full cost of the clinic is over $17,000. All of this was as a result of unloading the clinic from the top of the bottom of the clinic where the court and the other county property had been thrown over. Uh, I'll paraphrase uh, Dr. Newberry's comments, which is that if you're working for a humane organization, they should have a policy in place that tells you how to handle these cases. And certainly some of the veterinary teaching hospitals have that. And it's a surprise to me that every um, teaching hospital that's in a state where reporting is mandated, that they don't all have policies. I know Penn has one. I think Colorado has one. Penn doesn't have mandatory reporting by state. But they have a policy in their teaching hospital for how people should act. But um, as Dr. Newberry suggested, your organization should have a written policy that supports you. And the other thing is that if they don't, um, you should still try to document as much as you can. Take pictures, call law enforcement, call, you know, if there's a vet that's associated with the practice, you know, work directly with them and recognize that we had lots of animals that came into us that. Our folks investigated, and the investigations didn't go anywhere because we just didn't get enough information. But again, you may be saving the life of other animals by, by following that course of action. Was that a question or? Um, the question is, what do you do about sanctuaries where they've taken in more animals than they can provide care for, and obviously their intentions are good. And that's one of the things that we talk about with animal hoarding. And, and we've seen in animal hoarding situations, unfortunately, that a lot of those cases are shelters, foster care groups, rescue groups. And, and those, are, those are huge cases. I mean, the ASPCA has been involved in going to some shelters and having to rescue hundreds of animals. 
So that's a case again where you may need to, to talk to, you know, you've got to talk to law enforcement, you've got to talk to animal control. If you go in and, and you seize those animals, where are they going to go? Nobody likes to see you go into a hoarding situation and euthanize the animals. So you've got to have rescue situations. They're tremendously expensive, you know, to run these operations. Um, the ASPCA has been involved in, in countless operations like that. And we run into a lot of obstacles because we try to bring in vets from around the country to try to help triage the animals. And the state board says they're not licensed. Can they come in? And we're saying that some of these cases are man-made disasters. You know, we think of disasters as being flooding or tornadoes and things like that. But when you go to a place like Tiger Ranch and there's like 700 animals at risk, at immediate risk. Um, that, so in cases like with sanctuaries, a lot of times you have to get a search warrant to go in. And, and, and document. You can't just walk in and, and just decide that, you know, there's a problem here. There has to be an investigation. So there's a lot of procedures that you have to go through. They're, they're, those are not easy cases at all. I don't know, Dr. Newberry, did you want to comment on that? I know you've been involved with reporting cases as well, so. So and just to paraphrase uh, Dr. Newberry's comments, is essentially that if you get an individual animal that's being brought in, um, you need to file a report to advocate on behalf of improving the situation for that animal. And that may, in fact, lead um, to further action being taken against the sanctuary. And recognizing that good intentions um, don't offset the cruelty and the, the pain and the suffering that these animals are undergoing. So again, it's not even just about, our goal is not necessarily to punish people. It's to teach people how to do better, and it's to rescue the animals. And that's, as a profession, we need to keep that uppermost in our minds, that we're here to advocate for the animals. And if that, we, we don't dictate what happens to people along the way, and that's the good thing about it. So we don't have to feel guilty that because we filed a report, somebody ended up having to pay a fine or do probation. We don't make that determination. The court does that. And in order for the court to make an informed decision, they need to have all the input from us and all the input from law enforcement that's gone to the house and found you know, the conditions the animal was in and so on. So it's not, it's not our burden alone. We're just the one little piece of it. I think there was another question. Yes. Oh. So the question is sort of, how does this impact large animal practitioners? And it's very difficult, because if you're dealing with agricultural practice, most state laws are going to exempt um, farm animal practice. So it's really, really tough. And a lot of the things that, um, like we talk about withholding food and water, well, we do that with poultry when we're doing forced molting. So a lot of the things that we're force feeding of, of geese, a lot of the things that are happening to these animals, isolation, um, you know, with veal calves and so on and so forth. A lot of the stuff is almost institutionalized and it's protected as a normal agricultural practice. So um, I don't have a good answer for that. And so one of the things that happened in New York when we tried to get felony animal cruelty was that farm animals and agriculture, that was all exempt. Because the Farm Animal Bureau put up such a struggle because of their fear that small animal practitioners would all come and swarm over the farms and report them. So uh, that's a real challenge. Come tonight. Thank you. Thank you.